Good morning, good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's. How are we doing? We good? Do grab yourself coffee and cake if you haven't already. Uh, welcome, my name's Craig. I'm the vicar. What's your name? Rose. This is Rose. What's your name? No name. No name. You have to work it out. That's your challenge. And what's your name? Freddie. Freddie. Are you preaching today, Freddie? I know we've got Fred preaching, haven't we? We've got Freddie preaching. I think it might be the big Freddie. But will you preach here one day? Maybe. Yeah, who knows? Wait and see. Well, um, a warm welcome to our service. It's great to have you here in the building and online. Uh, and we're going to kick off with some action songs. So over to you, Zoe. Uh, if you're able to, please stand as we begin our worship together. Should we get some children up on the stage? Nothing is impossible. 
Good morning, welcome to our service. Uh, what fun, there was a bit of traffic getting on and off the stage, hence the slight delay. Good problem to have, isn't it? We need some traffic lights with all these children coming on and off. Um, just, my name is Will, uh, and um, having been off on holiday for a week, I'm pleased to be back here now with you all. Um, we are gonna continue the last bit of our series this morning on giving, um, and so we've got Freddie Pym, who's gonna come and talk to us, and he is looking at sacrifice as gain um, so excited to hear about that we've sort of split it up over a couple of weeks a few weeks ago about a month ago and, and now over the last couple of weeks as well so um, so that's good and exciting and we're gonna have fun worshiping together and praying together and being family together as well should we take a look at our essentials yes let's do that do you want to do kids first oh we'll s- let's do kids go on let's say that spice it up should we pray Come for the children what's going on Go on, Tom. We'll send the children out before we yeah. um, do the essentials then. And let's just pray for them as they go. Great. Oh, are you, do you want to come up and tell us about it? Are you? Dude, come on up. Come on. <laughs> let's do what we normally do. Grab this mic here. Thank you. Morning. In youth today, we are looking at uh, meekness and humility, uh, trying to understand what the conventional sort of worldly view of meekness and humility is and try to understand what Jesus says about meekness and humility, what Paul says about meekness and humility, uh, so we can do it well uh, and be attractive Christians. In, not in a, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? We do. Thank you. I think Will's been on holiday too long, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're looking at a new series today called Encounters with Jesus, and um, I'm kicking off today with um, John the Baptist's encounter with Jesus and how he is baptized in the River Jordan and how that... Um, can sort of lead on into our lives with the children. Great. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of young people in this church. Lord, we thank you for the gift of all people. Uh, But we especially pray for our young people because we want, Lord, people to meet you uh, and to fall in love with you uh, and to follow you for all the days of their lives. So, Lord, we pray uh, for Tom and for Cindy as they lead St. Paul's kids and St. Paul's youth this morning and fill them with your spirit. Uh, And Lord, may we have great conversations this week with our young people about who you are uh, and why you love us uh, and why we should love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, Will, here's your moment. Let's watch the essentials. Hi, I'm Sophie, and here are your essentials. Starting up again this week. It's so exciting! So keep a look out for everything that's going on so you don't miss out. Are you good with kids? Kids like these? If so, speak to a member of the children's team or go on our website to get involved in our Thank fantastic you. children's ministry. You will not be bored. Coming up soon, we have our brand new afternoon alpha. Have you got big questions about life? Are you feeling grumpy about the answers that the world has to offer? If you have any questions and want to sign up, please speak to a member of team or look on our website. Today on The Essentials, we have a guest speaker. She's called Heather Bunting, and she's going to talk to us about... Um... (laughs) Small groups. 
in a big church, everyone needs to be looked after. So here at St Paul's, we're looking to develop a number of small groups so that everyone can be nurtured and cared for. We are looking for people who are willing to lead and to host these groups in their homes. We're looking for all sorts of people. Those people who have been Christians for all of their lives, those people who have just become Christians, those people who feel confident about sharing their, their experiences with other people. And even if you're not confident, people who think that they might like to share their experiences with other people and to help people to discover what they've discovered. If you think this could be you, then please come along to our training that we set up for April the 23rd at 7.30. In the training, we will empower you to run your group and to help you to meet the needs of those that come along to your group. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you. If you'd like to come on the evening, please come and see me, Heather Bunting, to sign up. And I can't wait to join with you to begin this wonderful journey of small groups. For all this and more, check social media. Amazing. Hi, I'm Sophie, and here We're going to get it twice. <laughs> now, just to say with small groups, the best place to start your journey with that is the website. The website is the place where we try and put the best information we've got. Uh, it has the groups on there, uh, and there's a form on there where if you put your information into it, uh, it will ping it off to uh, Heather and to Sam, our associate minister, uh, and then they are uh, they're responsible for making sure that we put you into the best small group uh, that's right for you uh, so that you can uh, meet God uh, locally uh, and uh, journey with him every day. So go to the website. Cool. Amazing. Uh, should we stand together and uh, go into a time of worship? Uh, and I'll, I'll pray as we sort of just get into that space of Lord with the Lord. God, um, I thank you that you made us human beings, not human doings, and that means that we get to be uh, in you. And Lord, I pray that in this time this morning, we can just concentrate again on who you made us to be, and who you call us to be, and that we don't have to worry about the things that we have to do and those to-do lists, but just, just focus on being in your presence. So Lord, would you come now by your Holy Spirit? Would you come and fill us afresh as we open our hearts uh, and open our ears and our eyes to see and hear you and uh, welcome you into this church, this community, uh, this people now. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break, his broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. <coughs> so open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Oh, 
Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Search the world, but he couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied. Hearing your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid To show you my weakness my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all. You still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You are all the only one. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn grace into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You 
You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comfort, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, feet of confess, fullness of God in
Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, we thank you that that is true for each of us here, both in the building and online, Lord. And if we're feeling it, then brilliant. But if we're not, Lord, we're going to trust you with it. And Lord, whatever our pains and struggles, joys and celebrations we bring with us this morning, we trust you, we follow you, 
and we choose you. Lord, help us to be gentle with ourselves. Help us to be gentle with those who we love as we walk with you each and every day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Do take a seat. I think we're going to pray for our two to fours who go out uh, for their fun time, their uh, faith time. So let's pray for them. I think they're having too much fun over there already. Is that right, Zoe? People going out, two to fours? I think they are. Let's pray. Do you want to pray for them? Do you want me to pray for them? Father, we thank you for the gift of our two to fours, Lord, for our young minds. Lord, we pray today that they will encounter you uh, in their fun and their faith-filled activities. Lord, you are not ageist. You speak to anybody uh, who wants to speak to you. And Lord, we pray that you will meet them today in their play, in their dreams, uh, and in the places you will have them later today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to have our preacher next, our reader. Yeah, Who's reading. reading for us? Yeah. Anyone expecting to read? There we go. Tim, come on down. We're going to have our reader, and then we've got Freddie who will come and bring us our Bible uh, next. Right, this morning's reading is uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11, no confidence in the flesh. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection, resurrection from the dead. Thank you, Tim. Wow, what a great reading, hey? I want to know Christ is, is right in there. Uh, I'm going to invite up Ready, Steady, Freddy. <laughs> Here he is. <laughs> Where do, you, do you want this here? Do you want it in the middle? Just right there, yeah? Cool. You have this off me. Okay, all right. Uh, let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for Freddy. Lord, I thank you, um, Lord, just for the input you've placed into this man's life over the years. Uh, I thank you that he comes here willing um, and obedient to you to share. Uh, Lord, I pray that you speak through him now to each of us listening. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Yes, good morning. It is great to be here with you. Um, as I think we've already heard, we are continuing our giving series today. And we're looking particularly at the gain of sacrifice. So um, I think right at the start of this talk, it's important for us to grasp this principle. Sacrifice brings freedom. When we give something up, when we let it go, it gives us a freedom. 
I think that's often counterintuitive or, or even just plain wrong. It doesn't really make sense, but it is true. Sacrifice gives freedom. And I'm going to try to illustrate this with uh, a story, okay? So um, when I was at university in my second year, I moved in with four, uh, well, three other guys. There were four of us. One of those guys, he would steal whatever food he could get his hands on in the fridge. He didn't admit to it, but by about the November of our first year, it was very obvious that there's, there was only one person in the house who wasn't respecting fridge boundaries, and, uh, and it was him. And uh, this all came to a head when it was a dark Monday night. We were at rugby training, um, or three of us were at rugby training, and Jack, the guy that stole the food, he was in the house unsupervised. And uh, it was cold, it was wet. You know, one of those real miserable November nights when winter's closing in. And I got back from rugby training, freezing cold, very, very wet, very tired. And the only thing that had kept me going during that rugby training session had been the thought of this delicious stir fry I was going to make when I got home. And what I found was, as I opened the fridge, Jack had taken all of the vegetables for my stir fry. So what I was left with uh, was chicken and noodles, which is not the most exciting stir fry man has ever eaten. And uh, and I was very upset about this, really angry with him. And the next day, I was in the house with uh, one of the other guys, one of the people that didn't steal food. And we had this second fridge in our living room. The landlady, when we'd moved in, had said, well, here's another fridge. There's four of you. You might not fit all of your stuff in in the one fridge in the kitchen. We'd never turned the second fridge on because we did fit all of our stuff in that fridge. And being students, we were trying to save money and, and, and keep costs down. So we decided we'd turn on the secret fridge in the living room and put our food in it and not tell Jack, the guy that was stealing the food. And that was a great plan. It worked really well until Cal, the third guy, came home, the guy that didn't steal food. Because he then was like, well, I want to put my food in the secret fridge too. And we said, no, 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 you can't do that. Because then Jack will realize the only food in the fridge is his. And then he'll clock that something's going on. He'll find our food in the secret fridge. He'll start stealing it again. So I I did a terrible thing. I I did a terrible thing. I'm still ashamed of this, but I did it. We sacrificed Cal. We said, Cal, mate, sorry, you're on your own. Keep, you have to keep using the normal fridge. We're using the secret fridge. And so for the rest of that year, poor Cal had his food stolen um, while, while we had freedom from Jack, the food stealer. So in that situation, sacrifice, I mean, it wasn't my sacrifice, to be fair, but sacrifice bought freedom. Now, I, I think there are maybe better examples, more virtuous examples, perhaps, I should give you. Think of, uh, in very obvious terms, when we, when we sacrifice uh, an addiction to cigarettes, when we give up cigarettes, we gain freedom from that addiction. We break the power the cigarettes hold over us. Um, think of it in more subtle ways, too. Let's talk about Roger Federer. Okay, that guy had the most effortless grace on the tennis court. He's got to be one of the best tennis players. I, you know, he just made it all look so easy. How did he gain such freedom? It was through sacrifice, through persistent effort, hard work, dedication, day after day, from probably infancy through childhood, um, teenage years, and into his professional career, practicing harder than anyone else, training longer than anyone else, and that gave him the freedom of the tennis court. So sacrifice gives freedom. So Paul, in our passage today, is boasting in the freedom he has in Christ. He's telling us that he considers all things rubbish compared to knowing Christ. He's proclaiming that he's free from the grip that the world once held over him. You know, as a man who once lived a life as the most devout, the most God-fearing of Jews. He is boasting that he's now free of the power that all of that held over him. And it is now to him worth nothing compared with the joy of being found in Christ. How has he attained that freedom? By giving it up, by sacrificing all that he once spent his life trying to build and achieve. If we just rewind a bit and think about the broader context of this passage, okay, um, the Philippian church that Paul is writing to, they are thriving, but they're being disturbed by uh, teachers who are telling them that, that the, the new converts to Christianity should be practicing more traditional Jewish methods. Um, and particularly, they're talking about circumcision in this, pa- in, in this passage. And Paul is preaching against this, this suggestion that, the, that new Jewish converts should be circumcised, or new, new, I should say new non-Jewish converts to Christianity should be circumcised like traditional Jews. So when, when we think of the early church, it, it's tempting to sort of 
assume that all of the stuff that we do and that we've, we've you know, been doing for the last 10 or even 100 or perhaps 1,000 years, they've been doing since the start. But actually, if you think of the early church, it was looking for an identity. When the first disciples, when they met the risen Christ, when they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they took that out but they took it out onto the streets of Jerusalem and into Israel. So when the early church first started, it was really a revolutionary Jewish sect, a new understanding of Judaism and a renewing of Judaism from the inside. But that, so really the early church was very Jewish in its first identity. And then Paul comes along and he takes this revolutionary Jewish sect and he exports it to the Roman world and specifically to non-Jews. And this sets up this, con this conflict here. How far should new non-Jewish Christians practice traditional Jewish you know, methods and, and traditional Jewish things? And in, in this passage, Paul is preaching against these teachers. He calls them mutilators of the flesh. He's saying, you don't need to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. He says, we are the true circumcision. What he means is, as Christians, we don't need an outward sign of our devotion to God because... Elsewhere in, in his letters, he talks about having the circumcision of the heart, that, that we have the Holy Spirit as, as, a, as, a, as like a seal within us, which is worth so much more than an outward sign of our religion. And then he goes on to explain how once he was the most devout Jew, and he's given that all up and now has such freedom in Christ. Actually, we're not going to go too far into this Jewish practice versus Christian practice debate because what we're looking at today through, through this subject of gain in sacrifice, we're looking at the deeper principle here, which is that Paul is saying he once had so much and yet he's gained so much more. So we're going to look at the gain of sacrifice Paul is talking about now. Firstly, by thinking about sacrificing our will, submitting to Christ, and then we're going to talk about sacrifice of money. So let's start by thinking about sacrificing our will. So submission gets a bad reputation in our culture. Um, you know, when you think of uh, submission, you think of perhaps a persecuted minority being forced to submit to an overbearing government. Um, you think maybe of an asylum seeker in an unjust system or perhaps, you know, um, political activists submitting maybe in Russia or somewhere like Iran. Um, submission is seen as a bad thing. The idea that we have to be pressured or coerced to give up our free will. Um, the idea that letting someone has power over us, you know, that's bad to our, our, our cultural ears. Personally, I don't have a huge problem with submission. Um, Becky and I, my wife, I think we've been married for eight years in September. And throughout those eight years, we've been learning all about mutual submission. Um, for exa example, Becky might say to me, um, I think you should change your WhatsApp profile picture. And I would say to Becky, well, I like my WhatsApp profile picture. It's, it's a profile picture with, of me on holiday with my friends before I was married, perhaps. And she'd say, yeah, but it would be nice to have a good one of us. And so we'll think about it and then we'll do what Becky wants. Um, or, um, you know, uh, we're cooking dinner. Becky says, what would you like to have for tea? I'll say, well, I'd like pepperoni pizza. I love pizza. And she says, mm, might be nice to get some vegetables in. And, you know, we'll think about it, and, and, and then we'll have vegetables for tea. You know, and that, that is mutual submission. I say what I want, Becky says what she wants, and, of course, we do what Becky wants. It's, you know, it's completely mutual. She's out with uh, the kids at the moment, so I'm getting away with this. She doesn't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I am being silly, backpedaling. We submit to each other in all sorts of ways. Um, but I still think submission has a bad reputation in our culture. I think our culture is much more drawn to ideas of self-fulfillment and, uh, and freedom of expression than it is to the words of Jesus when he said, if any man would come after me, let him, take up, sorry, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You know, those words are a command to submit, to deny ourselves. But they are scary. They are hard to live out in practice. 
The thing is, Jesus didn't just die a death of submission. He lived a life of submission. Jesus upended cultural notions of power and position. He said in Matthew, you're not called to be rabbi, and neither are you to call yourselves master. Jesus shattered the customs of his day by taking women and children seriously. You know, this is the suffering servant who picked up a cloth and washed the disciples' feet, taking the position of the lowest servant. You know, Jesus submitted himself in the ultimate way by dying on the cross. He could have called down legions of angels to utterly destroy those Roman soldiers who were persecuting him and torturing him and mocking him and stringing him up. But instead, he he held that power and chose not to use it. He chose to submit to the will of the other. And that, that is the essence of submission. That is the purest form of submission. When we hold all of the power, when we hold all of the authority, and yet we still choose to do the will of another. Paul echoes this cross-shaped life in our verse. He says, For the sake of Christ Jesus my Lord, I have lost all things. And then he goes on, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. You know, Paul tells us, I am absolutely submitted to Christ. I have given up everything I once had in order to follow Jesus. And then he says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Well, I think we all agree with that bit. And then he goes on and says, and to know his suffering in death. He's so submitted to Christ, he's prepared to be tortured and crucified as Christ was. You know, I think it's the great paradox at the heart of the Christian faith. You know, the Christian faith is free. Salvation is a free gift, totally undeserved, something we could never earn, we could never work towards. It is given to us so freely. And yet, as we come to understand the message of Christ, as we let his Holy Spirit work within us, the message of Christ comes to cost us everything. And yet, if you ask a Christian who's lived a cross-shaped life, any Christian who, who knows Christ intimately, they will say, if you ask them, was it worth it? That everything they had before becoming a Christian is as nothing compared to the joy of knowing Christ, compared to the peace of knowing Christ, compared to the freedom of life in Christ. So that's submitting our will to Christ. Now let's think briefly about money. Paul isn't explicitly talking about money, so I apologize for bringing it into this this subject, but I think it's important and hopefully uh, I can draw out why I'm going here. Um, Let's start with the passage itself. So Paul is at pains to point out that from the perspective of a first century Jew, he had everything. What he's saying is, you know, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, the best of of the best. In regards to the law, he was a Pharisee. You know, he knew the law better than the religious authorities. As for zeal, I was persecuting the church. He had a reputation as as someone who was going after this new Christian sect before he was a Christian, obviously. He He was known throughout the Jewish world for this zeal he had. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless, he's boasting that he never broke the Old Testament commandments, not even once. Perhaps that's hyperbolic. But he's saying, when you think of attaining respect and and position and authority within Jewish circles, I had it all. I was up there as the very best of them. To a first century Jew trying to stand out amongst their peers, amongst their community, he was at the pinnacle of his game. Now, I think for us, when we hear this boast, it's perhaps hard to grasp sort of the the awe that Paul was expecting his audience to hear it with. I mean, in our culture where money and fame are the culture that people, I'm sorry, the currency that people crave and the currency that most people chase after, Paul's boasting doesn't sound that impressive. You know, we sort of think, well, that's all right, great, Paul, well done for achieving all that, but You know, if I was living in the first century, I'm not sure that would be what I would have been doing. But actually, to the Jews of the first century, where their community was was based around religious practice, where, where esteem and privilege and respect came from how you achieved within your religious faith... You know, he he had everything. Paul was at the top of the tree. I think um, 
An example for us would be like if Elon Musk or Bill Gates was boasting that everything they had was worth nothing compared with knowing Christ. The difference being Paul is boasting in this freedom for one reason, and that is that, that, is that he has already lost all of that Jewish respect and authority that he had previously spent his whole life trying to build up and achieve. Paul laid down his position as a Hebrew of Hebrews. He sacrificed that respect within Jewish circles when he gave it all up and followed Christ. Paul had spent his life trying to build something, and yet he put it at the foot of the cross. He lost it all, and then he boasts that everything he had done before knowing Christ is nothing compared with knowing him. So this would be Elon Musk giving away all of his money, selling all of his Tesla shares and all the other stuff he owns, giving up his patents, impovering him sh- himself so completely that he has nothing left, and then tweeting on Twitter, which of course he'd no longer own, it is all nothing compared with knowing Jesus. That is the equivalent of what Paul is saying here. So Paul isn't explicitly talking about money, but he's saying he gave up that thing which is most precious to him in the whole world. And this is going back to what we're saying about submitting our lives to Christ. Because in our culture, as I said earlier, money is the currency that we're all chasing. Um, perhaps not within this church, but within the wider, the wider sort of Western world. You know, we spend our lives talking about economic growth and comparing who's growing better than who amongst countries. Uh, we venerate the wealthy. We all perhaps consume more and more American media now through streaming services. And we're absorbing that American dream where the, the, the self-made person who starts with nothing and builds themselves up until they are incredibly wealthy. That, that now isn't so much an American dream. I think so often in our wider culture in the UK, that is just the dream that people have, the thing that they want to do with their lives. But that isn't what a life submitted to Christ looks like. Jesus meets a rich young ruler in in Luke's gospel who asks him what he must do to inherit eternal life. And he tells the rich young ruler to give away all of his possessions and then he can enter the kingdom of heaven. Then he can become uh, a true disciple. Elsewhere in Luke, Jesus meets Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus has a transformational, uh, a transformational uh, meeting with, with the Lord uh, and uh, becomes a disciple. And he proclaims after that transformation that he is going to give away half of his possessions to the poor. So when I, when I read these two passages and compare them, the question in my mind is, why is it that Zacchaeus only had to give away half his money and the rich young ruler was told to give away everything? And perhaps for me, the, the real question is, and what does that mean about me? But the the thing is this, okay, Zacchaeus met Jesus and was transformed. And from that place of transformation, he gave away his wealth. The rich young ruler had so much that he was in thrall to the power of wealth. His, that, that money was blocking him from truly entering the kingdom of heaven because he couldn't let it go. It was the thing that his heart craved after. You know, money, uh, I, I was talking uh, about all of the, the way that money dominates the headlines uh, and how everyone chases wealth. I think actually so often, perhaps more pertinently in Western and our area, it's not that people spend their lives trying to become incredibly wealthy. I, I think it's, it's actually often that we, we spend our lives just trying to make it through, you know, live hand to mouth, get enough just to get by. Um, the world might chase after money, but I think so often when you step onto the streets, actually, money still dominates thinking. Money, money still holds this great power over our town. But it's not because everyone is so wealthy and, and, is, and is living that, that American dream. It's because uh, the cost of living is so high and because money is such a scary thing if you don't have enough of it. But that brings us back to the gain of sacrifice. Remember, it's when we give something up that we gain freedom. If we want to break the power of money, the fear that we live in perhaps, we need to give uh, some of our money up. We don't have to be like the rich young ruler and give up everything. Perhaps we don't even need to be like Zacchaeus and give up half of our wealth. But it is as we give It is as we sacrifice of that wealth that we gain freedom from it. 
And like the rich young ruler, if money is, does have power over us, it is as we sacrifice of it that we take it out of that place it holds in our hearts, that we break the power it has over us, and that allows us to submit to Christ, to take up our cross and follow him. So how much do we have to sacrifice in order to know freedom? Actually, I think there are lots of people that will give different percentages or even amounts. I, I, I don't think, actually, it's about any of those things. I think the meaning of sacrifice is giving something that means to us, that, that hurts us. I think if we want to break the power that money has over us, if we want to live free of the fear that we perhaps hold uh, or, or, or live in with wealth, with money, we need to give until it hurts. Now, that means very different things to very different people, you know. If you're someone living paycheck to paycheck who's struggling with an overdraft, it doesn't take giving much at all to, for it to hurt and for, it, you know, for you to feel it. There isn't much at all for it to be a true sacrifice. If, if we you know, have more money in the bank, if we're able to go out for nice meals, go on holidays... Actually, it takes a bit more to give until we notice it. But if we truly want to sacrifice for Christ, if we truly want to know the freedom that comes when we give, we, have, we can't just give out of our excess. We can't just give money almost that we don't notice. Because it's when we, when we do that, it's not really a sacrifice at all. But as we come into land here, If we want to take up our our cross and follow Christ, if we want to submit to him, if we want to know the joy and the peace and the freedom of Christ more, if we want to follow him more fully, I think we do have to ask that question. Is there something which holds power over us? Is there something that's, that's blocking us from fully taking up our cross and following him? Now, that may not be money. We may, we may already give generously to the church, give enough that it hurts us. There are many other things that can hold power over us that can, you know, impinge our ability to know Christ more. But if we want to know the freedom of Christ, if we want to know the gain of sacrifice, if we want to more fully know the Lord's peace, if we want to more fully know the Lord's joy, I think we have to ask the Holy Spirit to show us if there are things that we should be sacrificing in some small way in order to find that peace, that love, that joy. I'm going to close in prayer. Would you stand with me and I'll pray for us? Yes, Lord Jesus, thank you that you were the suffering servant, that you are the suffering servant. Thank you, Lord, uh, for the gift of your death, the power of your resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that you lived a cross-shaped life and you showed us what that means for us today. Holy Spirit, we invite you to move amongst us now. We thank you for this church, for the way that it serves you, for the way that it sacrifices in order to glorify you. Lord, we know that you know all of the ways that we serve you, all of the sacrifices we've made over the years. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you now to move amongst us, to open our ears, open the eyes of our hearts. If indeed there are things that have power over us, that are blocking us from knowing you more, from taking up our cross and following you, we invite you now to reveal those things to us. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to give us the strength to sacrifice those things in some small way, that we may know you more that we may love you more, that we may come to a fuller knowledge of the freedom that comes in sacrifice. Amen. Shall we take that to God? Shall we worship?
Rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest water. A sovereign hand will be my guide. A feeling fancy surrounds me. You never fail, and you won't stop now. And now you will call upon your name and keep my eyes. Oceans rise, the song will rest in your embrace. For I am yours, and you are mine. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Me walk upon the waters wherever you will call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Me walk upon. Upon the waters, wherever you will call me, take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. We're going to continue in just time of worship now, but there's an opportunity for you to receive prayer if there's something from um, what Freddie said this morning um, that's really touched uh, your heart, tugged on your heart, um, or just uh, yeah, something which just brought something to light for you. Uh, I think just a few things just to call out. Um, one is uh, that the sacrifice of, of your will and uh, of the things in your life, um, perhaps in particular the things that have got a hold on you, and whether that's through some kind of addiction, whether that's debt, whether it's those things that are stopping you from having that freedom that you desire and that God desires for you as well. 
Um, and so if, if that's you, if there's something that you feel as though you need to give over to God, it's not going to happen in one go. It's not going to happen in one prayer. Usually that is a process, but start that now or further that now um, in prayer. Um, you're welcome to come to the front. There will be a ministry team who will come and pray with you. Um, you don't have to give them details. You can just say, just please pray for me. Just stand with me as I stand here in front of the Lord and, and give that to God. So, um, so that's one thing. And then just on money in particular, um, I'm acutely aware that uh, the 99% of us are not the wealthy um, and that we may be in debt. We may be going um, hand to mouth um, on each paycheck or each um, universal credit payment or, or whatever it is um, our income is. Um, and that is not easy. Uh, it's not easy to, to give um, from nothing. <laughs> um, so, um, but you can, you can deal with that. There's people there to support that. And God wants to provide. And we want, uh, we want to put our trust in God that he's always going to provide. And whatever our circumstances are, um, there are people who can help with, with debt. There are people who can um, just guide you through that process if that is the situation that you're in. Uh, or if you are fortunate enough that um, actually you've got money and you're just not quite sure what to do with it, how to give that to God, um, then come and pray with somebody about that and ask God about that. So it's just a few things there. And you may have other things that God has laid on your heart this morning or just triggered in your mind um, for prayer. So if that is the case, I encourage you, um, don't go away from here this morning without um, praying with somebody uh, or coming standing at the front and, and taking that step and saying, God, I want to meet with you. I want to have a conversation with you about this thing. So I'm just going to pray now as we um, just go into a bit more worship. Lord, I thank you um, that you are a loving God, that you're a good God, that you've got good things uh, for us. Lord, I pray um, that uh, we trust you. Lord, I thank you for your provision. I pray, God, that we can look back over our lives and see where you have been good and you have provided for us. And now in those circumstances where it feels like uh, we haven't got, that actually we look and we can see that we have got because we've got you above all things. And Lord, we can offer ourselves, we can offer um, our, our money, our debt, our situations to you now, God, that you just come into our lives and uh, support us through that as you have done with so many people. And Lord, we just bring ourselves to you now in worship in a time where as a community we come together and recognize you above all things. Amen. that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in all oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Oh, the sun says free. child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who oh, the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house. There's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me, 
I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. My father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Father, we thank you that you are a good father who likes to give good gifts. And Lord, as we leave this place this week, may we be reminded that you have good things for us. Uh, And Lord, wherever we're walking uh, through difficult times, Lord, may we know that often you carry us, uh, but you always go before us. So Lord, wherever you send us this week, may we go knowing that we get to hold your hand and that you are that good, good Father. Thank you and amen. Thank you so much for joining us for our 11 o'clock service. Just to remind you that we are here again tonight for our 7 p.m., so do come and join us uh, if you uh, would like to. Uh, And we're going to go with the blessing. So, sisters and brothers, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us. Goodbye, and God bless.